I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about, um, I guess, sort of blast theory is kind of history and blast theory is kind of strategies for how we make uh, artistic games is one way of talking about it. Um, but we also talk about um, our projects as being kind of um, much more around sort of situations or experiences and kind of games is just kind of one of the frames that we use. Um, and so hopefully I'll, I'll talk through a few examples of the work that we've made uh, and also talk about some of the ideas about how we actually sort of structure interaction or participation and how we think about it in the course of kind of trying to design those experiences. Um, yeah, so uh, Blast Theory, uh, as Krishna probably knows, has been around for a long time. Uh, it feels like a long time. Um, so the group started in 1991, uh, and I work with two other artists, uh, Matt Adams and Juro Farr, who are both founding members. I met them a few years later. Um, and, and the work that we made when we, probably the first 10 years of our um, experience as sort of a group of artists was, was really based and driven around uh, an experience of um, live art practice and theater in the sort of late eighties, early nineties, and trying to find a, a, a sort of mechanism for making work, which, which really felt accessible and attracted a different audience. At that time, we were a group of young people who were all going to see live music, going clubbing, uh, kind of going out and having kind of attending kind of social experiences. And it felt like theatre had sort of um, was somehow missing the boat on, on what um, a kind of cultural engagement or an experiential cultural event might be um, by, sort of, by remaining tied to, uh, I guess, the kind of practices of Brasini March theatres and, and those sorts of receiving houses and looking at, well, what's the other kinds of spaces we could use? What are the other kinds of languages we can employ? What are the kind of references that we can bring from popular culture, including um, things like uh, club culture uh, and live music into our work to kind of make it more accessible? Um, so this image is from the very first Blast Theory project, which was um, a project called Gunmen Kill 3. Uh, and the structure of the project was it's, it was an evening. Um, it was a very loose group of us at that time who were making the work, who each worked on different kind of aspects of the show, kind of a collage of events in a space that you kind of wandered around. So you're free to spend an evening wandering around this sort of space. Um, and it mixed choreography, installation, and audience participation. Uh, and the, the moment that you see in this image is um, part of the show where the show is sort of comes to a halt, everything in the space stops. Uh, uh, and a kind of, I, I suppose, one of, one, of, one of the group asks the whole audience if anyone has ever fired a gun, uh, and it, they offer the opportunity to fire a gun as part of the evening. Um, we then uh, explain that it's a paintball gun, and, but you're going to be firing it at a real person. Uh, and so uh, people then are able to volunteer to try and um, hit uh, one of our performers uh, with a paintball gun. And this also explains kind of the potential impacts in that range, what kind of bruise it will leave. But it was really a kind of moment of crystallizing that, um, of thinking about what Blast Theory work is, I suppose. It feels like a, an archetypical moment in a, in a Blast Theory show, the sense that you're not just here to spectate, you're here to be part of an experience, to be uh, one of the, actors or one of the, the keys of this experience to, to kind of make it happen. And it's been a, I suppose, a, um, a touchstone for all of our work kind of going forwards. And I'll talk about that more. Um, so Blast Theory now, I mean, this was obviously in the 1990s um, and we've been working for, for, for longer than that, but uh, we, we now make a, a range of different kinds of work. So um, when we first, uh, when we first started making work, we were using found spaces. And over the course of the 90s, that, that work sort of transformed a little bit. We started moving into sort of black box studio spaces like the ICA or the Green Room or Arnold Feeney in Bristol. Um, and in some ways that was great. We found a home for the kind of work that we were making. 
but in other ways, it, it also felt like a limitation. Uh, and, and one of the projects I'll talk to you about, a project called Kidnap, was one of the ways that we tried to reinvigorate the kind of spaces that we work in, and I'll talk about space. But nowadays, we make work for all kinds of spaces, for online, for in, in galleries and museums, uh, but also working with uh, participatory work where people come in person, uh, and often those, those projects are supported by some work using mobile devices, mobile phones, to kind of support interaction or to do coordination. Um, yeah, so as I say, games is just one of the frames of reference that we use to talk about work. And we, we kind of, when we think about our work, it, it, it always starts from the point of view that we don't really know what it is that we're trying to make or what we're trying to say. Often, like, we're trying to tackle questions that we don't feel uh, ourselves necessarily the best place to answer. And so one of the strategies we use is to think about our work as a, as a prompt. Uh, and I know and, and Alex Kelly was talking about the, the prompts that, for, for stories. And from our point of view, yes, we're also kind of making kind of prompts. And our, our hope is to try and talk, bring up a sort of a sense of a critical reflection in the, in the structures or the situations that we're able to make. And some of those situations are, are we do actually describe as games because that's one of the ways that people feel enabled to participate. You know, people understand what a game is and that it is something that's very active as opposed to something that's like theatre. Um, but we also are particularly interested in the city as a, a site for, for, for play or for engaging in these kind of critical reflections and using kind of mobile technology as, as one of the one of the, the means to do that. And I guess one of the kind of key reasons for that is precisely the, the affordances of that mobile technology has brought to our society in how we're able to organize ourselves, how, we, how it enables our relationships over distance or over time, and also really sort of how we kind of create meaning from our lives. The idea that we have these things in our pockets that we can use to record our lives or engage with the people that mean most to us. And yet, somehow, it, it, they have been transformative. And so I think mobile technology is one of the key recurring themes and critiquing that is one of the things that we uh, really try and do. And I think the, the, the very last thing that we think about is around speech and who has a voice in our work. And I, I'll come to that as the final point of our talk. So the first project, which I think was kind of seminal in the kind of history of our work that I really wanted to explain and try and give a, a, a sort of a, a, an understanding of how, how we think about projects is a, a project called Kidnap in 1998. So as I say, for the during the 90s, we had been making a series of works that took place as sort of collage performances, which were often promenades, often in black box theatres. Um, but the defining characteristic of them was that they took place over a, an hour or two. Um, they had a number of performers. They might be interactive or have some forms of participation, but they were kind of defined by the spaces that host them and the time frame of an evening event. And we had begun work on a, a, a project that was in a performance of, in a similar vein that was inspired by a, a trial called the Spanner Trial, which was about um, as a trial that was going to the European Court of uh, a group of um, men who had been involved in a sadomasochistic party, uh, and videos of the party had got into the hands of the Vice Squad, uh, and um, some of the men at the party had then been were in the process of being prosecuted for things such as grievous bodily harm, and we were intrigued by the idea that there was a video of an event where was explicitly consent, consensual amongst all the participants, but somehow there was this also this kind of paradoxically they were able to be uh, um, prosecuted for the events in this party. And so we looked more broadly at that the sense of giving up control and the idea that people enjoy uh, somehow having things done for them or done to them. Uh, and we were making a, a performance along this line where. Um, we invited audiences to watch performers giving up control to one another. Uh, and for about six months in the process of developing this performance, we 
just struggled to find any any traction in how this was interesting or how this was an interesting experience for the audience. Um, but the moment the the moment that the project crystallized and turned around uh, was when we realized that we could choose that the, we would invite the audience to give up control to us. Um, and that was the genesis of a, a project called Kidnap. So um, it, the structure of Kidnap was that we would run a lottery and anyone could buy a ticket for the lottery for £10. Uh, and by buying a ticket, you would become an entrant. Uh, and then on a specific date in the summer of uh, 1998, uh, we would, if you, were, if you won the lottery, we would come and find you and we would kidnap you. We would hold you hostage uh, for 48 hours. Um, and those 48 hours of captivity were then streamed on the internet. So you could see two people uh, in a, a safe house where we held them uh, for those two days. And they were eventually released uh, to a press conference. So um, the experience was uh, very novel from our point of view. It kind of taught us a very different understanding of about what the work is. Um, so as part of the project, we had a free phone line that you could call in order to get a registration form. We, we worked with uh, um, a PR company who uh, Put, got stories into uh, various national press. So we, we were on the front cover of the Sunday Times culture section. Uh, um, we also um, had a, a 30 second advert that was shown within uh, the advertising reel in cinemas. So we advertised the, the lottery as a, almost as a service where you could be taken away from your everyday life. Um, on the day of the actual kidnap, uh, we received a, a phone message to the, the free phone line. And this was actually a message that was left by one of the entrants uh, to the project. Um, he left a message saying, I know you're outside in the van, you're not going to get me. Uh, and this message came from someone who thought they had been, that they were the winner of our lottery. Um, it turns out they weren't the winner. We weren't outside their house in the van, um, but they thought that we were. Um, and this was a kind of inspirational moment for us in thinking about how we could make work or where we would make work and how we would think about the location and timing and space of work and who is important and who is at the center of the work. Um, so, the first thing that kind of came from this was this notion of the audience as a protagonist. Uh, and for us, you know, it's, it's commonplace in interactive projects to think about audiences as users or players. Uh, but we're, we're really intrigued by the notion of audiences as protagonists because uh, clearly uh, a protagonist is, is, is often the center of a story, but it's primarily a story or a, a drama as opposed to. Uh, an interactive system. So the, the perspective is uh, what's the inner life of the person or what's the inner life of our character? Where have they come from? Where are they going to? What will they learn? It's not, it's thinking about uh, their consciousness, their feelings, their experience. And we often think of our work from the point of view of user journeys that we write. We kind of write narrations of, of, of our projects based on archetypes or people we propose as as audience members. Um, so secondly, it, it also means that we, we it allows us to think about, um, uh, it allows us to think about um, control and power uh, in the context of interactive systems or interaction. So one of the, one of the I guess, sort of uh, ironic or one of the, one of the characteristics of protagonists is that they're not necessarily uh, always in control of uh, the story or control of the situations that they find themselves in. Some of the kind of greatest heroes uh, are, are often in prison or they're involved in negotiations or relationships with characters or circumstances out of their control. And I think one of the, the myths that, or one of the fallacies that I think we've 
feel in when we're making work around specifically thinking about technology is this sort of is the, the the notion that sort of technology is somehow a facilitator or an empowering uh, or inherently empowering and i think yes it can be there, can, there are ways that technology can be used to empower people but also technological or interactive systems and technology can equally be used as forms of control and i think that's one of the the critiques that we we have when we think about uh, interaction or interactive systems is that is, is really looking for where control is actually taking place who is actually designing the the path that people were put on uh, and where do people actually get to choose or where do people actually get to speak um, so one of the the projects i think is archetypical of the these kinds of questions around control is a project called orica and Amy compliant which was um a piece of work we made for the uh, Venice Biennale in 2009. And it, it was really a response to uh, what was known as the war on terror. Uh, and I guess was the kind of common, the, 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 sort of the, the common just, the, the, the commonplace justifications for um, the war in Afghanistan and the invasion of, of Iraq um, in, the, in, the, in the wake of uh, September of the 11th. Um, and we were intrigued that there was, there had been a kind of growing kind of, I guess, a, a growing set of sort of discussions around terrorism and what terrorism might be. Uh, but somehow it was done almost with uh, an absence of, uh, of recollection of historic terrorist movements that had their genesis in Europe. And so we thought there was a, an interesting space to kind of give an, a, a fresh account of, of those uh, terrorist movements, so um, Ulrika in the title is Ulrika Meinhof uh, from the Red Army faction. And Eamon is Eamon Collins, who was uh, a member of the Irish Republican Army, who later be uh, became um, uh, a kind of uh, an informant for the, for the um, RUC. Um, and each of them had very particular stories around how they became radicalized uh, and also how it impacted on their personal lives. Um, Ulrika uh, gave up her, her relationship with her child and Eamon also had a, a very difficult relationship with his family when he became uh, an informant. Uh, and so we wanted to find a space to talk about terrorism and political violence that really sat outside of existing uh, discussions around um, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and so this is the project. Um, so I've got a little video clip which kind of shows a small section of the work. Hello, it's me. You and I are going on a walk together. Hello. Uh, Outside, it's 1973. I'd like to be Eamon. Hello, Eamon. I'll stay on the line while you walk. Keep your eyes open. Act natural. There's always a first time for this kind of thing, and practice makes it easier. I'm going to count to ten. If you're still on the line when I get to 10, then I'll know where you stand. One, the two killers ride into Warren Point on a motorbike. Two, they switch the engine off, allowing the bike to glide the last 20 meters so as not to raise the alarm. Three, once inside, Iceman goes down the corridor into Toombs' office. Four, he takes up a firing position with arms outstretched. Five, his gun jams, giving Toombs enough time to reach for his own weapon. Six, Iceman leaps onto him, and the two men struggle. Seven, a second gunman comes running down the hall and shouts, stand back. Eight, Iceman lets go, and the second man fires several shots into Toombs. Nine. Iceman clears his weapon. 
10, he pumps several more rounds into tombs as he lies dying. Don't be shy. It's a question we all have to answer from time to time. And today, it's your turn. What can you do for the people around you? Now, get moving. Stand up and walk away from the bench. Do not look back. So, um, yeah, so in Aurica and Aiman compliant, you're invited to choose uh, whether you are Aurica or Aiman. And in the course of choosing, you, you move from a, a space in a gallery, which is a, a sort of wooden box where you pick up a telephone and a, pa a pair of sunglasses, and you're guided on the phone um, through a series of automated calls through the events of the life of one of those two people. Um, at various points within the walk, you're, you get to choose whether you, you agree with the choices that that person made. And those, those, each of those, those moments in their life is a kind of step towards an act of political violence. And the section you hear uh, is, um, is um, one of the moments where um, Eamon Collins actually helped coordinate the assassination of a member of the IUC. Um, when you get to the end of your walk, if you, assuming you've agreed and consented to follow on uh, listening or proceeding with through the, the life of the person you've chosen, you're then uh, taken to a space which is identical to the beginning space, and you're asked the question, what would you fight for? Um, and you're then given a space of 10 minutes to have an open-ended conversation, which may or may not lead to you talking about instances where you would potentially turn to violence as a form of uh, action or response. So one of the, the characteristics of this is obviously that we, we talk to you in the, first, in the second person as if you are um, Eamon or you are Ulrika throughout the piece. Um, and when we interview you, it's not explicit uh, as to whether we're interviewing you as Eamon and you were asking you to put yourself in their shoes um, or whether you're answering the questions of the interview uh, as yourself. So this kind of links to one of the, the this, I guess the second kind of piece of learning that really kind of came from uh, Kidnap and uh, Kidnap was also the, the, the year that we first began working with uh, a lab at the University of Nottingham called the Mixed Reality Lab. So um, mixed reality is a, a sort of an idea that uh, came uh, originally from uh, immersive virtual environments where people were trying to connect physical space to three-dimensional virtual worlds. Um, uh, and in the 90s, uh, which is when the Mixed Reality Lab started, uh, it was really focused on how do you blend virtual objects and real objects in a kind of hybrid space that is both digital and physical. Um, one of the things that changed with the, the arrival of mobile technology was really um, to move from hybridity being around a physical space, the hybridity being about how digital interfaces start in entering the physical world so that uh, digital interfaces appear it's sort of on, on every monitor and every hand that you, where you have a, a mobile phone, but even uh, where you're using sort of a digitally connected devices around the house or to the degree where sort of digital infrastructure is supporting the very sort of the means by which we live. Um, and the, the characteristic that this really kind of brought to the physical world is, is this sort of sense of a kind of staccato, uh, a, a staccato sort of reinventing of, of what reality is and how we experience our daily lives. We've moved from a, 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 a setting where by and large, uh, our experience is determined by our physical circumstances and moving through physical space as a way of changing or uh, um, experiencing kind of new 
um, new environments or new new sort of settings or situations to one where literally uh, on a second by second basis we could be being confronted with new information or new situations based on a message that has arrived or something that we're connected to uh, through a digital device. So we've worked with uh, the Mixed Reality Lab on a number of projects that have really started to sort of delve into this kind of space and this sort of notion that mixed reality is really not just around a sort of a change in the sort of architecture of space, but also a change in the architecture of consciousness. Um, and the first of these projects was a project called Can You See Me Now uh, in 2001, which was our, our first uh, work using kind of mobile devices, which was a, an online chase where uh, audiences online were able to chase performers who are physically running around the streets of the city, um, all the way up to uh, projects like Karen. So one of, the, one of the other properties that we found with the move from mixed reality, of mixed reality from a, a, a kind of spatially sort of defined kind of uh, virtual and digital, digital uh, space to something that's, that's more embedded within the world is, is, a, is really thinking about how, um, uh, the technology is pervasive over time. And so one of the projects that we, we have worked on um, that really takes advantage of this is a project called Karen, where um, it's structured as a real-time experience, where over the course of two weeks, uh, someone who professes to be a life coach called Karen uh, starts a, a, a series of sessions of uh, life coaching video calls with you. Uh, um, and it transpires that um, she's just starting out on this process uh, and that there are some loose ends about her own life that uh, become embroiled in, in the series of sessions that she has with me. But one of the, the, the characteristics of the project is that it really tries to interleave what it learns about you and who you are and what you bring to the experience into the story of, of of, of the experience. And one of the ways that we structured the script for this was precisely to write the script from the point of view of your relationship with the characters and how you would be changing your relationship through your, your engagement in the, in the video course. Um, one of the, the more recent projects we have that really uh, sort of thinks about um, sort of mixed reality or that really ex exploits this sort of thinking about mixed reality uh, is a, a project called Spit Spreads, Spreads Death. Uh, and this was a parade that we created for the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. So um, Philadelphia was one of the cities in, a, in the United States that was hardest hit by the 1918-19 uh, 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 flu pandemic. Um, and one of the reasons for it was that uh, the city elders decided to hold a, a, a fundraising parade for the First World War. Um, in the face of um, opposition from the sort of medical establishment who warned that it would be a, um, a super spreading event in the, in the, in the life of um, the flu pandemic, which had already begun. And it turned out to be the case that it was. Uh, and um, over the course of, uh, I think, the, the pandemic in the wake of the parade in uh, the original parade, uh, something like at this peak, uh, it was killing something like 1500 people a day in the city. Um, so we were inspired by this event to, to, uh, to make a parade of our own that allowed people to actually explore uh, the death records of uh, those people who died from uh, 100 years previously and choose someone that they wanted to represent on the parade. Um, People had a, like a, a mobile phone app that they could use to do browsing of the records and having chosen someone and they, when they physically attended, they would then be given a, a, death, a, a printed death certificate of the original death certificate from, uh, from that person. And they would then be asked to represent that person during, during the course of the parade. Um, so I've got another little video clip which hopefully shows how that worked. Jacob J. 
criminal Robert Pierce Ruth Anna Barr Martin Reynolds Norman Brow So um as you can see during the parade each person is invited to stand uh, between uh, two large uh, illuminated floats that were part of the parade. Um, and this was a kind of moment of commemoration that each parader had uh, where they stood on their own. The, the, the singing that you hear in the background was uh, a, a choral piece of music um, that was commissioned uh, where the Philadelphia Choir sang the name of each person who died on the worst day of the, of the flu pandemic. Um, and that was played through speakers on the floats, but also um, braiders were able to play the 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 choir piece, the core piece, uh, back on their their mobile phones while they were braiding. So the kind of the last uh, point I wanted to make was, was around uh, um, kind of presence and speech. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, with with the parade, um, people are, are very much kind of present. Um, and uh, one of the things which I, uh, uh, is not sort of shown in the video, but was clear, was that people brought uh, memorabilia or family mementos from people who had died uh, in the flu pandemic from their family. Um, and that's one of the things which feels really. Uh, um, common, uh, I suppose one of the kind of the, the common goals for us is to really, uh, in the course of making people uh, protagonists in our work, it, one of the opportunities is to really invite people to bring themselves to the work and that sense of presence, uh, the kind of what it is that you have at stake in the work, what it is that you're, you're bringing is, 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 is really at the heart of what makes this thing more than a game or more than a, a, a piece of play. Um, so, uh, but asking people to speak is actually one of the, the hardest um, things that we find within the course of the work. Uh, but it, it feels less, it's, it's the kind of the most important part when it comes to inviting people to reflect critically. So I think going back to that, a sense of our goal is really around dialogue and around critical reflection and prompting conversations is, how do we actually find a space or a way, a means for people to talk in new ways and to talk in new ways based on new experiences? And the parade is one of the forms that we've done that. Um, but we've also worked uh, uh, in creating um, uh, forms, forms of video and of film where we're also trying to kind of create that prompt in a way. Um, so the, 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 the final project I want to talk about is a, a piece called My One Demand, which we made in 2015. Uh, and it was um, a feature film about unrequitedness, but un unrequitedness from the perspective of, of thinking about uh, a sense of powerlessness or a sense of being unwanted or, or of having, having no purpose. Uh, or, um, and I guess, the, we were intrigued by the relationship between the very personal and emotional experience of being rejected or uh, feeling regret um, compared to uh, what had recently been a, a kind of um, the, the, the challenge of a, a kind of global financial crisis where people were still in the midst of uh, the Occupy movement and protesting and trying to find a sort of a language and a form and a social uh, presence that could respond to what seemed like uh, this impossible, like absurd situation uh, of, of 
of, of how, uh, how, how powerless we had been in, in the face of a, sort of a kind of a banking crisis. Um, so this was the kind of subject of the film. And the form that it took was, uh, it was a single shot, which we, uh, a single steady cam shot, which was streamed live uh, to cinemas and online. And, and the film actually follows a journey over the course of something like seven kilometers across downtown Toronto to the edge of the city. So it's a single moving journey. Uh, and it follows a, a chain of seven individuals, each, each of them whom has a kind of story to tell about, uh, about um, their own experience of um, regret or loss or powerlessness. Um, and so I'm just gonna show a quick video of just the opening two minutes of that film. My name is Maggie, and it's been a beautiful day here in Toronto, just beautiful. Whether you're in the cinema here in the city or you're out on the web, I'm thrilled you're here with me. I'm on the ninth floor. Right in front of me, I can see the control room. And there's a lot of tension here. There's a lot of focus. Have you ever seen the NASA control room for space flights? with rows of technicians and engineers at desks in front of a huge screen. Yeah, well, it's nothing like that. But maybe a bit. There's a team of people making the final checks and tests. Because once we start, there's no going back. I came to Toronto in 1978. I was a farm girl from Saskatchewan. I rented a little room in a rooming house. I remember painting a horizon line all around my room. I really missed the space and the emptiness of the prairies. Tonight, I want you to meet some people who changed my life without even knowing it. I spoke to them all one day, nearly four years ago. And as I sit here tonight, thinking about each of these people, I wonder what they're thinking about and what they would have to say to me. And now that you're here, maybe you will have something to say too. This is Gia. Yeah, so the, the film begins with you meeting Gia, who is a kind of a, a baby, who's I think is something like three months old. Uh, and then each of the seven people that you meet is progressively sort of at a different stage in their life and there's a different uh, kind of relationship to, uh, I guess, power or sense of regret. Um, and each one talks from a very personal point of view. So the, the process was one where we interviewed the cast and got them each to talk about their own stories. Um, and during the course of the film, you're invited at four points in the film to answer a question. And this is the final question of the film. And so in a way, the whole of the film leads up to this moment where we invite you to speak, uh, even though it's the, you send a, a message to, to, into the film and the narrator then shares some of those. But for this final question, all of the responses that people give about regrets, about loss of things that they can't change, things that they, they they really, um, yeah, uh, 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 these, these things are all shared uh, as part of the, the closing credits of the film. Um, and so it's a moment where the lights of the, um, <clears throat> the lights of the cinema sort of come up slightly as you're, as you're familiar with when credits roll. Um, uh, and traditionally people start leaving, but um, um, in, with this, People sit and read in silence for, I think it's several minutes worth of, as it's hundreds and hundreds of things roll by of people's regrets. And uh, people sort of, as the lights come up, people look around the room and aware that uh, the things that have been shared have been shared by all the people in the room. That's one of the, I guess, one of the, the kind of moments where we, we tried to create a new form of speech, but also a new set of relationships between the kind of people who participate in the work. So I think that's that's me. 
Brilliant. Uh, Thank you, Nick. We we are a little bit short of time, but I would like to just ask one question before we before we let you go. Uh, it was really interesting, and I I am I'm I'm quite a fan of of Blast Theory's work, and the it's very strong politically and emotionally. I think um, it's really interesting. So I just wondered of of your all of your projects that you've done uh, and all of those prompts to the audience which which one do you think was the most powerful prompt well i, I remember the moment at the end of my one demand of being in this in, I, I think one we did it three times and the, like because the whole film was live so we do this sort of an hour and 45 minute journey with the cast kind of replaying kind of their stories and telling their stories live each night and then the audience kind of giving their responses uh, and I think the moment, that moment in the cinema when the lights come up and everyone just sort of sits in silence reading the, the responses that people have given. I think one of the one of the challenges I think often with our work is around it's it's very partly by design, partly by the technology. It's very focused on individuals. You know, Spitzberg's death is a parade with which there's a real sense of collective joy at the end of the parade. You know, everyone who took part. So that that was really rewarding. Uh, and I think with my one demand, that sort of moment of silence where everyone just reads through the hundreds of regrets that people have about their lives, whether it's kind of lost loved ones or illnesses or things that they never did. Um, and then they kind of, the lights come up and you look around the room and everyone's looking at each other like, it's one of you, one of you said that. Um, I think that's probably one of the most powerful moments for me. Because I think that because often, you know, we're doing a project actually in Redcar this weekend in North Yorkshire. So if anyone wants to do it, it's called Rider Spoke, which is again, very much around sort of reflection on life. Um, people go out on bikes and they kind of listen to kind of recordings that people have made. Um, but they, it's very, it's very sort of isolated. The technology sort of is very sort of, it, it leads you towards kind of, you know, the rhetoric around mobile technologies around connection, but the reality is that it just creates sort of narrow, narrow sort of channels of, of of connection that are very different to the kind of uh, a, a sort of a, a sort of something that's very personal. I think that's one of the the push forces that we've been trying to push against is kind of trying to find voices that actually use this technology in a way that feels humane. And I think you know it's a, it's a kind of challenge. Brilliant. Um, I will have to have a look out for that thing this weekend. But um. Uh, I'm sorry we've got to move on. Uh, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. And yeah, I, I hope we right. um, do something similar again sometime. And I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to your next project. Thanks for having me. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.